Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of DevOps Unbound. We've got a great topic, great panel. In 2023, where are we going with this thing called DevOps? <laughs> so, well, we're not not a predictions conversation. We're just kind of talking about the state of the art. What's what do we think is going to happen in the evolution of DevOps, and kind of what have we learned along the ways? My name is Mitch Ashley. I'm CTO with TechStrong Group. A co-host along with Alan Schimmel, who is busy on other activities. I think he's away on assignment, as they say in the biz, and uh, happy to be hosting in his stead. And uh, I, of course, want to thank our great friends at Tricentis. Tricentis has uh, sponsored DevOps Unbound since its beginning over two years ago. Been a fantastic partner, helping us with topics and guests and uh, creative input to uh, along the way. Uh, I'm working with uh, Lanier as well as with Jody on our uh, production uh, producer team. So thank you, uh, Trey Sentis, for sponsoring this show. Great. Well, let's move on to our topic. I first want to start by having our guests introduce themselves. Um, Hope, would you start? Sure. Uh, Hope Lynch, Senior Director of Platform at CloudBees, have been in technology for a long, long time. So uh, very interested in talking about these changes today. Fantastic. Tim, jump right in there. Sure. Tim Banks, Lead Developer Advocate with Dell Technologies. I've uh, been in the the DevOps game for a hot minute also. And uh, <clears throat> having been both in the cloud hyperscaler side and the uh, hardware manufacturer side and the private cloud side, just kind of looking forward to seeing what we do next. A lot of stuff we use today and, and going forward for sure. Thanks for being here, Tim. And welcome, Lee. Good to be talking with you again. Nice to see you again, Mitch. My name's Lee Atchison. I've been in cloud computing and DevOps since really they became words, I think. <laughs> and uh, I'm a software architect, uh, consultant, author, and my latest book, Overcoming IT Complexity, was just released uh, and is uh, is has been doing fine. Congratulations on the new book. Thank now you. our problems are solved. We've got the answers on how to deal with all that <laughs> complexity. Not to put too much pressure on you or over yourself. <laughs> no, it's a it's a fine book. Everybody check it out. It's an O'Reilly book. I'm well, Prague Doshi, uh, VP of Customer Engineering uh, here at Tricentis. Uh, really excited to be here and talk about our predictions for uh, this year. It's already 2023. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's see, let's see what happens. And you can't refer to the, you know, the first three weeks of January. I predict this because it's already happened. It's already <laughs> happened. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. Welcome, Rog. As always, great to have you with us. And again, thanks to uh, Tricentis for sponsoring DevOps Unbound. Uh, we're, we're talking about kind of where are we in the state of DevOps in this adoption? Some of us have been doing it maybe five, six, seven years. Other folks maybe earlier. Maybe it's pretty new, a year or less, maybe a year or two. You know, a lot of things have happened, I know, since. I remember first learning about DevOps. Um, Hope, why don't you start us out, kind of give give us a sort of your version of where we where we are on this continuum of yeah. whatever DevOps is and is going to become. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think it's a very interesting time, one of the most interesting I've seen since I've been involved with DevOps, and partly uh, the impacts of AI, ML, uh, low code, no code, all of these things that are sort of uh, converging at the same time on developers. And then people are also now thinking more about what is the experience for developers? How are they actually connected to the business? It's not the, you know, developer in the back room anymore. And it's, and it's, normalized now. This is part of how business is done, um, having DevOps as part of your practice. So uh, I I think we're at a very interesting time. Uh, I look forward to it playing out. Sure. We all agree. Nothing left to be said. I think you covered it all. No, no. no. (laughs) Some other opinions here. Jump in. So I, I would, you know, certainly uh, machine learning learning and AI, if, if that isn't the the headline of any discussion of the of the the future when it comes to DevOps, it's it, it really should be, and I, I agree with you, uh, Hope. But I'm also interested in the operation side of AI and machine learning. You know, it's we've already seen the use of 
heavy machine learning when it comes to analytics and and examining analytics and finding trends and large amounts of data and things like that. But I'm also really excited to see some of the things that might be happening with AI in, you know, uh, scanning code pre-deployment for security violations or just code reviews in general and the ability of what sorts of things are even bad actors that uh, that can be discovered um, pre-release. You know, we're, we're now, you know, DevOps has really enabled us to have, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of releases a day, you know, and, and Amazon still does what, one every 11 seconds, something like that. Um, and, that's a lot of code that's getting deployed to our applications and more and more applications are extending across multiple companies with SaaS services that fit into it, et cetera. So having tools like that, that can help us, you know, scan the reliability of our system before it becomes uh, an issue is going to be critical. So I think machine learning and AI is going to be critical, not only from the developer standpoint, and we're just seeing the beginning of what can happen there, but also on the operation standpoint and the the pre-release as well as post-release monitoring that that we can do. I think it's interesting you talk about how uh, how AI and ML will will kind of drive DevOps, but I do think that we also have to take into account that DevOps, like the the deployment of AI and ML, uh, both you know whether whether it's the data stores, whether it's the analytics that, that go into creating these models, right, or the uh, the actual hardware itself. Uh, that's going to require a lot of wrenches turn in the DevOps pipelines, and yeah. it's not going to be the same as always. I think the other big concern that I have as far as ANML is that how do we keep these pools of data from generating malware themselves? Like, how do we keep it pure? How do we how do we keep people from predicting what questions are going to get asked over time and start injecting malicious answers to them? Right, uh, and the more that we are reliant on AI and ML to do these kinds of basic programming things. And, and they say, oh, well, we can replace junior engineers, which I don't believe. But the more that we come reliant on AI for answers, the less scrut- the less scrutiny we're giving those answers. And I think that's a big gap. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think uh, chat AI has kind of proven that and brought that to the the, the forefront when, uh, you know, they they the open AI team actively acknowledges that the reliability of the answers are are sometimes suspect because of the learning that went into the data and and the process used for that learning process for that learning uh procedure yeah but i have i will say though that i have seen you know poking around in reddit in uh some of the devops corners there where there are developers who are saying um they're using it uh as a coding partner now right uh they are using it to come up with additional ideas find shortcuts so it's not that it's replacing them and they are not, right. you know, blind faith in it. Thank goodness. Thank but, goodness. <laughs> uh, but it is helping them have access to a wider oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. category of ideas faster. Brian, yeah. I know this is a topic you've got a lot of oh, yes. uh, thoughts on. Uh, so jump in there. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was just waiting there because, um, you know, agree with everybody. And, you know, I know chat GPT, everybody's like, wow, this is so awesome. It's going to change everything. And then uh, there's a segment of the population as has been for the last, what, six decades since the word robot was coined by Isaac Asimov, right? That, oh, jobs are at stake. Okay. Well, let's look at what DevOps has done to all these companies to increase profitability and how much depth have we gotten into all these major enterprises it's still not uh, prevalent. Like more, there are more development teams that are not using these agile, lean DevOps processes. So it takes a village to get DevOps right. So as with any new technology, uh, as with AI has always been, I see it as decision support systems, as, as I think Hope was uh, talking about. How do we empower? Like there's too much put on the developers. And the, the security comment of another scanner finding anomalies, heck, I have enough scanners. I'm so tired of them. The signal noise ratio is just terrible. So I need to know what are the things to care about. So if I have AI to be the decision support system for humans to do their job better, well, I, I'd be happy if it takes only 80% of the village right now. It takes a thousand people to do it in a hundred billion dollar 
market cap company today to do it right at scale for thousands of different agile teams, right? So uh, we need all the help we can get. Um, I think uh, there's no shortage of jobs. And I see this AI movement as actually uh, empowering. Uh, and, and, you know, this might sound a little self-serving for a company like ours, Tricinus. We make uh, 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 tools that assure that whatever you're trying to do is done the way you expected testing, right? So you, you, you're, you're creating applications and software from your own imagination, from customers' requirements, and you have to validate whether or not they did that, right? So I think um, this is going to be the year where testing will explode. It will have a slow start. You know, AI has always been a part of testing and it will augment, it will enhance but we're always going to second guess, okay, did my chat GPT version 22, <laughs> I just made that up, right? Is it still good enough? Because what did I actually learn from the testing, right? The human still got to learn. You got to get the Oracle out of that the testing. So. To, to, to be clear, clear AI, right, Frog, think, did you well, say we might have oversold AI in the last no. six or more decades? No, no, I don't think we've <laughs> yes. oversold it. No, I, no, I mean, I actually, I do believe we have. I, I, I agree with you guys started in it. <laughs> I think we'll always second guess it, right? Like, look at the number of false positives, right? The signal noise ratio. So if it can help us reduce false positives, if it could take 10 different scanners, yeah, it, you know, that, that we use and, you know, different vendors of each of those same things that are semi overlapping and make it more intelligent and say, look, based on history, your software has done poorly in production in these areas at this step in the user's journey of using your application and therefore gives you a higher signal noise ratio to look here. This is not a false positive. Then we're just going to become more efficient. We're going to become more confident in releasing. I think that's what will happen. To, to be clear, I think AI of all stripes is a tool to help people. It's not a tool to replace people. And I think that's, you You bring up that point, I think you're right, that since the days of Isaac Asimov, that's been the fear of science fiction, but that's not the point at all. And and the you know nothing is more hyped nowadays than chat a chat gpt right i mean it's probably the most hyped technology available right now but in the end it's not a tool to replace people it is not but it can help um perform some types of tasks and some of the things that you know that machine learning is good for and some of the things that machine learning is good for is analyzing large quantities of data to look for anom uh, anomalies. And those anomalies can then be analyzed by humans to figure out what's going on or whatever. So I think the idea of scanning the, that we talk about is about finding ano uh, anomalies. My mouth isn't working yet this morning. I'm sorry about that. But, you know, the, you know, as we, as we move forward, it's like with, with thousands of releases going on a day, there's no way that we can reliably predict that all of that is accurate. So one good use for machine learning is to make sure to do the, the scanning, to look for changes in analytic data that happen and correlate them to releases. Some of those sorts of things are tools that help humans prevent them from having to spend all of that time that they're not good at and analyzing large quantities of data. Humans aren't good at spending large quantities of time looking at the same thing over and over again. Computers are very good at that. Machine learning is very good at that. Unless and, and for tools like that, it's we can be very spend useful a lot of time that. looking at YouTube. We can spend a lot of time looking at YouTube, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I have, a, I have a question for the, let, let's kind of shape this, take, take a little bit different direction. I appreciate the AI, ML and chat GPT and the, you know, that's sort of the shiny object at the moment in the world of AI and ML. Um, but the people part of it, we talked about, you know, there, there was, if I can bring up sort of a tangential example of the whole South with our airlines and baggage and scheduling and all of that kind of thing, not to, to drag them into the topic. But one of the takeaways for me out of that was they kicked back to fully manual, trying to do everything by hand when the systems didn't work. And it was clearly far beyond the capacity, not intellectually, but just quantity and the amount of data analyzed and situations to handle was far beyond what a, a human could do. And it seems like that's part of what we're doing in DevOps is increasing velocity by doing the things that we can do with software 
and then leveraging people's skills and expertise like Parag, I'm sure we don't need the top tester examining the results of every test run, right? You want that person working on the next set of challenges or whatever it might be. Yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, this whole uh, notion of AI, I'm going to uh, steal another one from uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's, it's uh, the fact that you need to be adaptable, right? So if you're really concerned about people and all, it's really you're in technology, your job is going to change. Actually, if you're not in technology, it changes. If you're a farmer, look, you know, in the 1800s, everybody knew a farmer, right? Now you, you can't find one, right? In, in your cities and all. So, so uh, agriculture has completely changed because now we know exactly where to irrigate, you know, every single uh, molecule of soil, if you will, right? So I think having AI or having uh, these capabilities come to market to make people more efficient, that's really why you're hired is for your creativity. Like you said, it's not for someone to examine, you know, a billion test results on that application. We want to know what are those five things that are going to lead to problems because this is the year of productivity, right? People are going to be tightening their belts. Okay. We're going to be rationalizing our applications. We're going to be rationalizing how much time you can spend building an application, testing an application and how efficiently you can continuously deploy it. So we're going to have to become smarter. And to the extent AI is just one other tool, it will allow us to develop more time to those areas where you were originally hired, right? To know out of the thousand different ways things can go wrong, what are those top five that could cause an outage or that could cause performance degradation? If you can home in on those things, then you can get in front of those kinds of things. And I think that's what role humans will play. And, and I think this also ties in so closely. And I, and I haven't seen anyone necessarily state it this way, but, uh, there's been a lot more conversation around developer experience. Like you said, you know, there are a lot of jobs open, right? Uh, and if developers are unhappy for too long or they're not getting the tools they need or, you know, the conditions of the workplace are, are not what, you know, they hope for, they're going to look for another opportunity. But if you can find a way to make their experience of working and how they develop their software and how they test their software and they get other tools to help them uh, and they feel more accomplished. They're able to be more creative. A lot of people forget that developers are creative people. Um, then, you know, they're happier. Their experience is better. Maybe they stay longer. Maybe they, uh, produce better product uh, for the what's, customers. What's happened over the years, developers have taken on more. Okay. Now developers are responsible for security. How many developers like to test even their own code, right? Do code reviews, right? They don't want to do these things. So I think this is going to be an explosion of more low code, right? That's what we're seeing in our market, that can we make tools reduce friction so much uh, so the developer doesn't have to think about the mundane, doesn't have to figure out, okay, which scanning tool do I have? It's actually left shifted into my pipeline. They don't have to think about Okay, I added 100 lines of code and I'm going to commit it. Did it actually cause a performance degradation? I can do a smoke performance test as part of the pipeline and I'm going to get a high signal to noise ratio of where things are, uh, where, where I need to put my attention. Oh, it was those last 100 lines of code that I added that has something to do with the change in performance, right? So I think low code um, and putting more and more into the pipeline so we can get less things piled on a developer. I think that's, that's what so, we need to do. So I think to that I'm going to disagree a little Tim. bit with that. Go ahead. Let's get Tim in here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I would say to, to that end, Prague, I think though the, the reason that more has been put on the developer has been maybe a result of, I would feel, what I feel is a misuse of the DevOps culture where the, instead of empowering a developer to be able to do more, they're saying, we could use these tools so the developers can be ops and they can do deployment. And now they can do security because now we have these tools for doing it. Instead of allowing those tools to enable people who specialize that to do those things. And you know, back to Hope's point earlier about, about uh, using, uh, or, and your point earlier, it's about utilizing AI and ML to enable folks to be able to make better choices, to use them at tools. That's not what we've seen in the past. We know that historically, engineering cultures, engineering leadership will say, well, we can 
use it to save money by getting rid of security people, by getting rid of operations folks, by getting rid of SRE, and then putting it all on developers, and then using managed services for the rest. And what I really think we need to start seeing the opposite of, right, is that over-reliance on tools and automation uh, because of what you saw, like with Southwest and things like that. Uh, and, and to the point of where we're talking about where folks are with careers and jobs, we saw, you know, what, twenty to 30,000 layoffs between three large companies, uh, not just junior folks, but some very, very senior talent. That is a big talent drain. That is a big drain of folks who knew how to do these things because it came from a time before everything was pushed on the developers, right? And so what's going to be the effect of that on our pipelines? What's going to be the effect of that on these companies that they build and the companies that these people eventually go to? And so I think what we're talking about how we use these tools to enable uh, people to do things, we need to talk about enabling people to still have specialties and still have areas of concentration so the developers can just develop and these tools can make the people in these specialties, whether it's operations or security or networking or whatever it is, more effective at their jobs instead of taking their jobs and putting it on the developer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I we think need enough for just getting it into the developer's site to bring in that specialty, right? If you see, hey, there's a CVE like this, I want to go to my security expert, a uh, uh, common vulnerability or exposure, right? I want to go to my security expert and ask, do I really need to care about this, right? The scanner brought this up, but uh, you know, I've got enough mitigating controls, right? So I think you're right, Tim. We need to. Uh, I, I think the short, short-sighted leaders get rid of the specialists, but the companies that are doing well actually add more specialists. It's hard to find security people, right? You know, so let me, let me bring this into the topic, the, the subject of platform engineering, and is that replacing DevOps or is it complementary or whatever it is? And the reading I've done about it, it's interesting that the rise of platform engineering in some ways comes from getting back to developer-friendly environments and developer productivity and kind of taking all the stuff that we've piled onto DevOps and DevOps tools and all the people involved and all of this is kind of pulling it back to being and making them do security. You know, as you're saying, Brock, it's like, let's kind of get back to the basics or the fundamentals that are going to help developers be more productive, but also that are more friendly to the developers. It, to me, it's kind of an interesting 180 counter reaction, maybe to where we are because of DevOps. And anybody agree, disagree, have a different viewpoint on platform engineering? Let me see how I can say this. You know, the, most developers I talk to, you know, that it, aren't afraid of having more things put on them. In fact, you know, they're 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 not the one. They're not sitting there saying, "Oh, now we've got to do security." No, it's it's they're, what they're more interested in is what tools do I have to help me do security because I know I need to worry about it. The best developers in the world already know what they're responsible for. They're responsible for everything. They just want the tools to help with that. One of the things I hear developers, if, if they complain about anything, the ones I talk to, it's about things, and I'm not saying I agree with this, but it's about things like low code, which come in and say, uh, you know, you know the, the, the types of low code that say, I'll do all this for you. You don't need to do this anymore. Just trust me. And that's the sort of tooling that scares developers because it's, but it's a black box. I don't know what this does. I don't know what it's going to do for me. I'm mm -hmm. trying to take control of this, and this okay. is taking control away from me. Yeah. The best tooling, the best platform engineering, isn't isn't the 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 responsibilities are going up. It's here's the tools to help you with your growing responsibilities that you already care about. Oh. And. Uh... Let me be controversial. <laughs> oh, please, sometimes, oh, please. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I feel a little bit that um, <laughs> platform engineering is the safe of DevOps for some organizations. And here is why. Sometimes management is like, you know what? Let's just get one team that's going to worry about all the tooling and standardize it across, you know, our, our enterprise so our developers don't have to worry about what tools they're going to use, right? We're, we're going to turn this into, you know, a, a sort of a factory uh, experience. But to Lee's point, 
developers like what they like. They have found tools that work, work the way their brains work. And now you have a platform engineering team, maybe in some organizations coming in saying, you know, that's not the approved tool anymore. You need to use this one because this is what everybody else is going to use. Get on board, right? So it's it's that standardization can go too far. I know in large enterprises, you have, you know, 11,000, 12,000, 15,000 developers. You have to figure something out. But, uh, you know, it, you know if, it's, if it's done like a heavy hammer, I, I, I think uh, that's, that's the wrong approach completely. You, you hit the nail on the head. It's actually a topic I talk about in the book is, is the idea of standardization versus choice. And it's a very, very, very hard line to draw. And ultimately, some you know, of, the, of the worst organizations, if you will, draw a hard line one way or the other. Ultimate developer choice, whatever you want, the complexity is overwhelming. Or ultimate standardization, sorry, this is the tool you use no matter what, developers are out the door. The reality is, you're, as you say, you have to give the developers the tools that they want to get the job done within the sandbox of guidance that is reasonable for the level of complexity that we that we want to allow in our organization. So I I like the 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 tools the the, the term sandboxing right where you can say here's the set of toys that we're playing with. and this is a changing size. You can bring toys in and we can talk about them, but this is the size of the sandbox. Within the sandbox, do whatever you want, and that sort of model I think helps a lot with this balance between choice versus complexity. I, I think um, this gets to some fundamental psychology uh, parts here too. But before I get into that, let me just talk about like how how is like platform engineering defined by analysts or or what do we think about platform, right? The word English word platform means to, to uh, you know, use as a foundation to build on top of, right? So um, the, the goal in removing or reducing some work from developers is all about reducing friction, right? Giving them more self-service, giving them things that, well, okay, the organization has already done tests on this stuff, so perhaps you can use this. But then it gets to the psychological need. Uh, developers, I agree with Lee 100%, they come out of just, just being a developer with the ethics of, I've got full accountability. It's my application. It's almost like my baby, and it's out there in production, and I want it to be the best thing since sliced bread. So, so they have the accountability from day one in, in terms of a mindset. OK, but then when it goes as far as control or if the engineering manager or upper senior, you know, senior layers above the developers are actually putting code uh, into systems uh, say, well, OK, um, I need to uh, I need you to control and be fully accountable with the sales of <laughs> your application in, in the market. Right. And the develop to, that kind of accountability is put onto uh, developers then the developer is going to naturally gravitate more towards control. Well, how could I be responsible for the business if you told me that I must use this stuff that's been intentionally encapsulated so I don't need to understand and, and just use it, right? So I, I'm giving up accountability. So I think when people use uh, platform engineering as a mechanism to say, I'm going to control what you do and remove choice from developers, then it's gotten too far. But when it's when it's used to actually reduce work, again, back to the AI thing, right? It is taking work off of the developer because that's where everything meets, right? And, and customer delight and, and achieving the functionality, the non-functional specs and everything, right? Uh, we're trying to spread out some of that workload. And I think that's where platforms can play very well especially where developers don't want to worry about it and be accountable for things like security, you know, plumbing. Okay. How, what service talks to one another? Well, what service is allowed to talk to one another? Is this data accessible from this system? Do I need to have data privacy tags around that data? Things like that, that if we can push down into the platform, then it does make us more productive. I mean, let's look at the rise of Kubernetes. Okay. Um, it's a lot of people have complained that, oh, that's too difficult. Well, I think that's a bunch of farce. 
uh, I can't think of a better word. It's just nonsense, right? It's it's developers or even operators that don't want to learn the fundamentals of distributed computing and systems engineering. Kubernetes and container platforms have just made it more simpler to solve that inherently complex problem, right? So when people say, oh, this is a tough technology, it's actually... Well, look at that's the power of platforms. Now there's a lot of things you're not worrying about, things that happen automatically in a platform that's taken care of for you so you can focus on your business applications. So if you don't rob yourself of the learning opportunity and you don't try to uh, you know have a control sort of mindset, then I think I think there's a there's a lot of benefit in the power of platforms here. So Parag, I'm gonna push back on you on this one about Kubernetes oh, being Okay. Having been an early adopter of Kubernetes, sure. it's not simple. <clears throat> it's extremely complex. The CNCF and the startup landscape will testify to that with all the people who are trying to make Kubernetes more simple, more approachable, more accessible. Kubernetes is not simple. It's extremely complicated. It started off simple, but it's not how we use it now. What we have now is not simple. And it gets more and more complicated as people try to use it for more and more and more. Right, And that's fine. Right. But there is a very, very large gap between understanding the concepts of containers and schedules and orchestration and its implementation. And Kubernetes does nothing to make that more simple. That all said, there is room for in Kubernetes the art of the possible, which is why I think people really go there. You can do a lot of stuff without having to write your own automation because there's a platform for it. But it's a lot like you know, you can get from one place to the other by flying a plane, but flying a plane is not simple and easy. So I think I think within our within the DevOps community, I do think that the level of tooling around trying to make Kubernetes more approachable, uh, you know, kind of speaks to its to the complications thereof. But it doesn't mean that we're we're you know not rising to the challenge or whatever. But we are recognizing that it is in fact not great. Uh, I think it also leaves room for something that something else that is maybe a little less not great. Uh, but you know what that is next, you know, we'll see. Uh, I, I think of it as in a constant innovation. So as you innovate, it's never perfect, right? So you keep improving, you make things better. Like if you look at CNCF, there isn't a cloud native testing tool in the CNCF landscape, but there are what a thousand different logos on the CNCF landscape page, right? So, so yes, there's those fundamental gaps there. And so what companies do is they say, okay, I'll go fill this gap. Oh, I'll go fill that gap. And I think what you have is you have inherent complexity, spreading an application on top of a lot of compute storage and network infrastructure and being able to rewind and replay what happened in production to go back and improve your application. I think there's just a lot of inherent complexity. If you look at DevOps as well, how many different DevOps technologies are out there today, right? There's there's hundreds of companies involved and they're, they're going at it from different perspectives, right? You have Git, there's multiple flavors of Git. You have uh, build tools, you have uh, places you store your build, right? You have image scanning tools, right? Uh, continuous deployment, GitOps tools, right? So I think if there's inherent complexity, you're always going to need to keep evolving to make things simpler and simpler, lower friction, and it's a matter of the maturity of the platform. So I would say Kubernetes is not done yet. Um, and I think there are customer, like if you were to say, um, how would I uh, take an application and write it the same way such that it runs in any environment? And if everybody had to build their own mechanism to do that, you'd probably come out with very similar things that, you know, we as an industry have developed. Well, but not necessarily. Okay, so, you know, we, there are different tools other than Kubernetes that accomplish the same thing. There's, for instance, ECS, which accomplishes a very similar set of problems but in a much simpler way. But but in AWS the problem only. is the problem mm -hmm. is that what Kubernetes does is Kubernetes gives choice, enhanced complexity. Yes. And what yes. ECS does is it says it gives opinions and, and yes. viewpoints and requirements. And therefore it's a lot simpler if you meet those requirements. But if you don't, it doesn't help you at all. So yes. the, the the this comes back to the complexity argument again. You you, you create your sandbox and that sandbox gives you a level of complexity and that's the way it goes. I think the problem with Kubernetes is 
they didn't put enough guardrails in place. And I think that's what some of these tools are doing, right? Some of these innovations that Tim is talking about, he's absolutely right, is they're trying to put some order on the chaos to, to reduce the complexity, rein in the complexity, and mm-hmm. give some reasonable best practice guidelines for how to use it, and therefore, at the same time, make it simpler to use. Right? Yeah, the same that- Kubernetes isn't... is isn't overly complex, I think is false. I think it is overly complex, but there's a reason why. There's a reason why, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's basically that thing that everyone um, has started to become more and more lately where everyone is like, you know, what's the golden path for, yeah. right, for the developer, right? Um, and, if, and if you can find that, they don't necessarily have to stay there, but they have some guidance. Yeah. I, I always look at the great philosopher of engineering, uh, uh, Commander Montgomery Scott, who said, the more you overhaul the plumbing, the easier it is to stop up the drain, <laughs> right? So Kubernetes uh, doesn't doesn't eliminate complexity. It just changes where it is, right? And I think that's the thing. The things that what we do is complex. The things we're trying to do are complex. There's no way to make that simple, but there's a way to change where that complexity lies, right? Uh, but in so doing, right, now you change who's in charge of fixing it, which is a whole other thing. That's right. It causes an organizational change, potentially. Too. Anybody right. that can inv- invoke uh, Scotty in the middle of a DevOps conversation has my ultimate respect. Oh, he's uh, the ultimate yeah, DevOps This engineer. seems like a conversation. <laughs> that, you know, what, two, th- two things can be true at the same time, right? There are some things that Kubernetes environment does simplify for you. It is also complex because, to your point uh, earlier, Lee, about with fl- great flexibility comes great complexity to misuse right. uh, Peter Parker's Uncle Ben's quote. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I think but we have Scotty great. and we have Spider Man both at the same time in the same oh, episode. Okay. That's not bad, right? And we had uh, somebody mentioned a physicist earlier. I forgot yeah. who you mentioned, but Neil deGrasse. Yeah, oh, I was yeah, thinking yeah. about the developer and the standardization debate. There's sort of the Goldilocks area where there's enough standardization that you don't get rebellion from the developers. Right. Uh, but at a certain point, if you tip it too far That's into right. the standardization mode, it kicks in Newtonian physics for every reaction. Standardization right. is an opposite and greater reaction by the developers to say, screw this, right. I'm going to do my own thing if you're going right. to put those yeah. bigger guardrails. Maybe I'll go look for it. It's the stretch rubber band. As long as it's stretching, you're fine. The moment it stops stretching, that's when you have a problem. (laughs) Or or someone built a new rubber band, right? Like gravitational (laughs) physics comes along and Newton wasn't that accurate. (laughs) It does. So let's do this. We have just a few minutes left. So we have to have to have short lightning round, short answers. What's the one thing you hope doesn't happen this year in DevOps? Like, please don't mess this up or please don't go down this avenue. We've made that mistake before or whatever you can think of. Whoever wants to jump in first. I hope that in our our uh, race to AI all the things and store all the data for AI, that we don't forget that there is a, a ecological cost to what we do. Uh, the the computers that we use to do AI and the, and the uh, amount of cycles we use to store all the data do cost. You know, not just money, but also energy. And I, I feel like if we get so wrapped up in trying to predict all the things that we may be predicting our own demise. Sustainability. Great. Who's next? I'll go next. Um, keeping on the AI theme, I I hope we don't focus too much on the word intelligence and AI and depending on, on um, this artificial a little bit more. Uh, in other words, I think... Uh, and let's believe less hype and and more reality for what AI truly is, which is less than what the hype says it is. Nick, um, I guess I'll add as technologies evolve and you know the DevOps continues to grow, I would say keep doing that. You know, keep keep the movement. You know, um, I know there's a lot of. Uh, uh, a myth that oh this is dying or even you know this this will be replaced by some other new thing out there or you will be replaced don't give up what you've been doing if you look back over every decade there's significant progress and then uh in that process don't use technology to keep you um to 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 stop you from continuously learning right so if we build platforms that become better that do have the guardrails that we want, that make things easier, have uh, less friction. Don't use it 
as a tool to say, oh, I don't need to understand what that platform does. Use it to your, you know, to empower you, but don't use it to keep you stupid, if you will, if I can say that. And never neglect operations. And, um, you know, I think since the dawn of applications running anywhere, whether in cloud or on-premises or for small customer groups or for the entire world, a uh, billion population, we still struggle to keep applications running and delighting customers. So think about that upfront security and operations and use the power of the platforms to help you get there. And know the platforms are not going to be perfect that people said on the call. And it mm-hmm. takes a long time to evolve standards and get people to agree. Just don't mm-hmm. give up hope. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of hope, you get the last word. Yeah. Um, yeah hope. What, I, <laughs> what I hope doesn't happen, and, and that's that's pretty tricky. I like it. Um, is I hope, you know, if we think about where we are in the economy, the layoffs, everything that is happening and, you know, the potential, you know, gloom that's on the horizon, um, I feel that developers in some organizations are starting to seem more like commodities than than people. So I'm hoping that that concept where people think about the 10x developer, um, they they continue to realize these these are actually people who are part of your organization. They they do a good job and they are critical but it just feels like there's a little bit of commoditization starting to happen in some organizations. And uh, I, I would like for that to not become uh, more widespread. I think it's a great note to end up on. Thank you all. Thanks to all of our panelists today. Uh, where are we heading in 2023 with DevOps? I think we had a lot of paths that we explored, and I'm sure some will come true and some won't. <laughs> we'll evolve. So thank you to our panelists. Uh, it was great to have you, Prague, Lee, Tim, and Hope. And thank you to Tricentis for being such an amazing sponsor and working with us in creating this uh, great programming coming to you on TechSong TV on DevOps Unbound. Hope you'll join us in another episode. Please check out techstrong.tv for more episodes of devops.com and I'm sorry, DevOps Unbound. And we will have uh, live roundtables too. So be sure and check out uh, those are available on the website. You'll see us under the webinar section. So take care, everybody. Thank you all. Take care.